Okay, good afternoon. Very pleased to be here. Very good to be able to come and speak to you this afternoon. Great to see such a well attended event, um, as always. Um, and thanks for sticking around to the final session. So my name's Andrew Harrison. Uh, I'm a neuropsychologist. Um, I've had the privilege of working with survivors of brain injury and their families for over 25 years in the voluntary sector initially, then in the NHS, and for the last 10 years in the private sector. Um, I actually work across two different companies, um, but I'm here today to represent Neurotherapy Services, or NTS. Uh, we're a private community-based multidisciplinary assessment and treatment service. Uh, we accept direct referrals from the public, as well as from professionals, clinicians, case managers, and so on. We've got a stand next door, um, and further information is available on our website, and I'll give you the address of that at the end. Um, so I think that's probably enough brazen and plugging uh, for one session. So I'll just crack on. Um, so yes, the theme of today's event is uh, well-being and living uh, with a brain injury. And uh, yeah, my talk focuses on managing and enhancing emotional well-being after brain injury. It's a kind of life, the universe, and everything kind of subject, which we could probably devote a whole full day to dis discussing in itself. But I just wanted to pick up a, f a few themes from my work and my experiences, um, highlighting some of the challenges, but also some of the opportunities um, that, that can arise after, um, after brain injury. Okay, so. Uh, there are many different kinds of acquired brain injury, uh, including non-traumatic brain injuries as a result of strokes and tumours and other conditions, um, and traumatic brain injuries themselves as a result of assaults and falls and accidents. Each kind of brain injury has its own characteristic features, but each brain injury is unique because each brain injury happens to a different person with a different brain living in a different environment, with a different background, and with different access to supports and resources. As you'll have heard about and may well be aware, most of you, traumatic brain injury is classified in terms of its severity, according to various key indicators. But there are significant individual differences at each of these severity levels. No two injuries are the same and no two recoveries are the same. There is not an exact linear relationship between severity of brain injury and outcome. Many people with what would be classified as a milder brain injury can report significant persisting cognitive and psychological problems. And some people who would be classified as having sustained a more moderate or severe traumatic brain injury can go on to defy expectation um, and make an incredible recovery. As we know, head injury can result in structural brain damage. And the nature and extent of the brain damage will determine the kinds of physical cognitive, emotional, and behavioral symptoms that we see. This will depend primarily on the mechanism of the injury itself, but also a variety of other factors, acute and post-acute treatment and support in hospital and in the community, and a wide range of personal and environmental factors which influence uh, presenting symptoms and recovery. But after traumatic brain injury, again, as many of you will be aware, the most, there are particular parts of the brain which are most commonly affected, especially the temporal lobes at the side of the brain, which are particularly important for memory and for language functioning, and the frontal lobes, which have, play a very significant role in terms of managing and controlling and regulating behavior and emotions, as we'll, we'll come on to. Again, as many of you will know, and many people will have experienced directly, the psychological impact of traumatic brain injury can be profound and life-changing. Each survivor of brain injury, their own emotional recovery is unique, 
that everybody experiences a process of trying to come to terms with life after the brain injury and living with its consequences. Emotional recovery, uh, in my experience, is best seen as a process, a process of adjustment and, hopefully, eventual acceptance, incorporating various stages or phases. Many people liken um, emotional recovery and emotional journey as being one of a grief, feelings of anger, feelings of sadness, resentment, and then a sense of, well, if this is it, then we've just got to get on with it, really. Personal identity and changes in personal identity are also very important, and I see that a lot in, in my, my work, about establishing a new post-brain injury identity, but not being defined by the brain injury. So there's a difficult balance. The description of being still me, but different. There's an old me and there's a new me. How do I make sense of these? The important part of emotional recovery is, is understanding of and expect, expectations for recovery. And really in the context of brain injury, the biggest question is what does recovery mean? Just like what does rehabilitation mean? Will I get better? And what does better mean? How much better? And what is better enough? You know, 98%, 70% or 100%? And a sense of, well, is this it? Is this gonna get any better? And often getting some fairly vague answers when the question's asked, is this it? Am I gonna get any better than this? There's also another theme which comes up um, a lot in my experience is about the trajectory of life. Everybody was on a path, everyone was on a journey before this injury intervened and the extent to which this may have been altered by the brain, brain injury. So this incorporates things like roles, goals, but also values. What was and what is important to me? Where was I heading before the brain injury and where am I heading now? Is it the same place or is it a different place? What do I want to achieve? What did I want to achieve and how am I going to achieve it? What do I need to do in order to, to get there? Again, as many of you will be aware, uh, many survivors of brain injury can experience psychological difficulties at one time or another. Sometimes these can resolve themselves spontaneously, sometimes they can persist, sometimes they can recur. Sometimes these can be managed uh, by the person themselves and sometimes they, they, they may be some form of treatment or in intervention may be required. These kinds of psycho psychological difficulties are common but they're not universal. But there is a high probability at some point or other one or possibly more of these psychological difficulties may occur for an individual after brain injury. And these are listed here and these will be very familiar to you, I'm sure. Depression, suicidality, uh, generalized anxiety as a pervasive sense of, of dread and discomfort, phobic anxieties, which are often associated with the location or the mechanism in which the brain injury was sustained, such as in a fall or an assault or in a road accident, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, which could be an extremely disabling condition, and post-traumatic stress disorder, which you'll be, I'm sure, will have heard about and, and, and have awareness of, including flashbacks to the incident, sense of reliving the incident, nightmares, and generally feeling jumpy, on edge, and easily startled. The key thing here really is the importance of being aware of changes in emotion and behavior and changes which might indicate the onset of these psychological difficulties. Particularly changes in sleep pattern, changes in appetite, a significant reduction in drive and motivation, social withdrawal, and changes in behavior and personality such as irritability and agitation, which might indicate that something is, is brewing and that a serious psychological difficulty is, is, is on the horizon. Also, in my experience, many survivors of brain injury also report significant and often very rapid changes in mood and emotion, which could be from day to day, hour to hour, or sometimes even minute to minute, which can feel very unsettling, very disturbing, and like being out of control and losing a sense of control over behavior and self. Often these are described as being like a, like a roller coaster of emotions and that it can be physically and mentally exhausting. 
This relates to difficulties regulating and controlling emotions and behaviour, so that things just, things just happen, behaviour just happens, can't, it can't be stopped until it's too late. Moods can swing, go from 0 to 100 in an instant, or like a switch has been flicked, and anger and temper outbursts. These sorts of changes, rapid changes in emotion and behavior can have a significant impact on social and personal relationships. They can be very difficult for family and friends to predict what's going to happen in a given circumstance and know what to do, when to intervene or when to step back, what the best thing is to do. And I think in broad terms, in my experience, there's really sort of three main emotional states that, get, that are described quite commonly. The first is a, a sense of just feeling down, feeling sad and upset about everything, uh, a characteristic state of feeling depressed, more emotional, distressed, tearful, feeling slowed down mentally and physically, withdrawing from people and activities, which is very important to try and counteract. And it may that this, this state may be accompanied by uh, suicidal thoughts and ideas. And that this can last for hours and days or longer, and it may just pass or it may persist and may need some active intervention. The second state that, that a lot of people describe to me is what I could really best just describe as being a bit hyper. So this sense of being being a buzzing almost, a kind of giddy feeling of being on kind of a high, but which can be very disconcerting and unreal and quite an unpleasant and quite de destabilizing sensation and can actually result in somebody being really quite, quite vulnerable, especially in social situations. So it's really the opposite end of the scale. So this can be characterized by acting impulsively without thinking of consequences, such as making purchases or, 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 or rash spending. Poor, showing poor judgment or awareness, not really thinking things through properly and giving due consideration. Being disinhibited, saying and doing the wrong thing, like not really judging the, the, the room and, and, and getting a sense of what's acceptable. Lacking a filter, very, very commonly mentioned, being blunt, being to the point, saying things just how it is, but in a way which could be personal and very hurtful. And changes in what's often described as social cognition, awareness of post personal boundaries, about reading verbal and nonverbal cues, making inappropriate comments, etc. And again, these can cause significant strain in relationships and make social situations very challenging. And quite often, the person themselves is not necessarily aware of what's happening at the time. They may not really be aware of it until the dust has settled sometime later, and maybe have had a conversation with a friend or family member to discuss. Uh, the fallout, maybe, of what, of what happened. And really, the third um, broad sort of emotional state um, that gets described to me a lot is, is as often described as being the most difficult of all, really, which is, which is a sort of lack of emotion, a lack of feeling, feeling nothing, feeling numb, feeling empty, detached, cold. And to the outside world, this may present as somebody who look, presents as quite flat in terms of their emotions, facially, their speech and behavior. Lacking drive, lacking enjoyment, feeling quite detached, like a sort of wall or a barrier is up between the person and themselves, or often described as being a little bit of like in a dream state, quite dissociated from what's happening around them. This in turn can lead to withdrawal from social and other activities, which is in itself significantly associated with, with further worsening of mood and anxiety and become a vicious cycle, which is very important to try to break, even though it feels often counterintuitive for the person to, to, to do so. So all of these psychological and behavioral changes, um, and, and, and particularly how, emotion, how we feel and how we express our emotions, are likely to be directly influenced, directly affected by the brain injury itself. Of course, this is going to depend on the nature and the severity of the injury, um, but as already described, and as, as you'll, you'll, you'll be aware, damage to the frontal lobes of the brain and connected brain areas is very common after traumatic brain injury. And the frontal lobes have, a, have an extremely important uh, central role in our sense of self-awareness, our sense of social awareness, and our ability to regulate and moderate our emotions and behaviors, 
all of which significantly impact on our social behavior and also our interpersonal functioning, being able to maintain relationships and friendships. So these affect how we both how we experience or feel emotion, but also how we express emotions to others, either verbally or non-verbally. And it's very important in terms of, uh, uh, of addressing these changes is to understand for, for each person as an individual how the brain injury, the person's own brain injury, is influencing these, these different aspects of, of, uh, of recovery. But as well as the brain injury itself, the sort of organic component, as it were, to emotions and behavior, there's also a very significant psychological component, which is resulting primarily from the emotional impact of living with a brain injury and its effects on day-to-day -day living. Um, there are common themes in terms of, of, of emotion um, uh, emotional recovery, as I've described before, to do with grief and to do with loss. Um, but again, each, each emotional recovery, each emotional journey is unique to the individual. Fluctuations in emotion and behavior to, expect, to be expected, perfectly normal, but that these can slip into more significant mental health episodes. And we need to be really mindful to signs and indicators that, uh, that significant change may be around the corner. There's no quick and easy solution to, to living with a brain injury. There's no e easy and quick solution to, be, to, to emotional recovery either. It's likely to be a long-term process, possibly lifelong. It's one of adjustment and acceptance so that the individual can live with the brain injury and with the consequences of the brain injury rather than fighting um, against it. There are lots and lots of approaches to managing emotional recovery after brain injury, which can, many of which can be accessed by individuals and families themselves, some of which require access to some form of treatment or input of some kind from a clinician or a specialist. There's an industry in itself, as I'm sure many of you are aware, to do with self-help in a variety of different settings. And traumatic brain injury and recovery from brain injury is no exception. There are some excellent books, there are some excellent resources, and there's also a lot of questionable stuff out there as well. So it can, it's, it, it's important to choose the resources very carefully. Relaxation and mindful te mindfulness techniques are, are, again can be accessed and, and a lot of people find those extremely helpful. What's also important is, is to ensure that the foundations of health and well-being are also addressed. But maintaining physical activity and exercise as far as possible, maintaining social leisure and vocational activity as far as possible, and ensuring that diet and other lifestyle factors are also addressed. So it's making sure that the foundations are, are dealt with first of all, as well as looking at other forms of strategy and other approaches. Clearly, alternative therapies and treatments are also available, um, which, which, so, which for some individuals prove to, to have a very profound effect and for others less so. Um, there's also counseling and psychological therapy, of course, and again, which, which for some people find extremely helpful and others less so. Probably the caveat to say here, of course, we, I don't have the time to go into detail about all the different kinds of therapy that are available, um, but this can be available through the NHS, um, albeit in, in a very uneven uh, access to services, but it can also be available via, via the private sector. The most important thing is to ensure that the provider is suitably accredited and suitably experienced. So especially looking for HCPC registration, but also that the person has particular skills and expertise in working with in individuals after brain injury is, is particularly important. And there are a number of different approaches that you, you, you may be aware of. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the most commonly referred to, but there's also a new wave of therapies as well, which, which are gathering an evidence base, such as accept, acceptance and commitment therapy and compassion-focused therapy which have, a, a, I think, a quite significant role to play in terms of enhancing emotional recovery after brain injury. And then, of course, there's medications as well, which could be accessed by the GP through a rehabilitation consultant or through a psychiatrist, antidepressants and anxiety medications and sedatives and so on. So, 
emotional well-being in recovery after brain injury is as unique to each individual, just as the, the brain injury is unique itself. What works for one person may not work for someone else. There's no one-size-fits-all approach to emotional recovery after brain injury. It's likely to be a combination of approaches used at different times and in different situations, which is going to be most effective. And the sort of toolkit analogy, I think, is, is relevant. Having a range of different strategies at hand, which can be used as required. I think the key factors, in my experience, in terms of facilitating emotional recovery after brain injury is, number one, for the individual to have a, a clear understanding of their brain injury what happened, the mechanisms and the effects on the brain and how this is likely to impact on day-to-day -day functioning, to develop a better understanding of their emotions and behaviours and signs that all may not be well and that something may need to be addressed, developing a sense of personal control over emotion and behaviour by actively applying strategies and approaches which can make a difference and acknowledging when we need help which can, of course, be one of the most difficult things to identify and one of the most difficult steps to take. And then, after doing that, taking advice on board and being able to apply it. So a lot of treatments and interventions will provide uh, different approaches, different resources, different suggestions, but then the application of that in day-to-day -day life can be particularly challenging. And sometimes the medicine is difficult uh, to take as well. So taking advice can be hard, and sometimes it can be the, the question of timing as much uh, as what the advice actually is and who it's coming from. We also, I think it's important in my experience to look at moderating expectation as well. That doesn't, that doesn't mean waving a white flag or giving up. It just means that sometimes a search for a cure may not be possible. But relief from symptoms is often much more attainable and looking for strategies or a combination of strategies which can facilitate um, uh, a relief from symptoms is perhaps often the most realistic uh, goal. So, in terms of resources, um, this is barely scratches the surface, and this is just really for reference for, for, for the, the slides are available on the web on the website. Um, I'm not going to go through this in, 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 in detail, but just to say there is a lot of, of, of good resources that are available out there. I put my email address on, on the end as well, so if anybody does want to get in touch and if there are any resources um, uh, or want to discuss that, then, then do get, get in touch. But um, I think the importance is, is accessing different formats. So podcasts, um, apps, um, as well as written materials and websites. Headway um, website, I'm sure many of you will be aware of, has some excellent leaflets and, and, and information and resources. Um, the Get Self Help website as well is very helpful. Got a lot of self-help materials uh, there to, re related to brain injury, but also other mental health and other conditions um, as well. And I've just put a paper on the bottom there, that Salas et al. paper, which I think is quite helpful if, if you're interested in, um, in a peer-reviewed article as it relates to emotional uh, changes. Okay, so nearly there. So I just wanted to um, finish off really with a, with a quote. Um, some of these quotes could be very pretentious sounding, but I just thought this was quite, quite a good one. Um, Secret of change is focus on the energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And I think in my experience, that's a, that's a truism after, after brain injury. Okay, so that is me. So thanks very much for hanging in there. Thanks for listening.